Hello, Integrated Math One. Welcome to the second half of this lesson, Module Two, Topic One, <laughs> Lesson Three. We're doing the second half of this today. Um, so we're gonna. Last time we were playing with vertical translations of our functions, right? We noticed it shifted up, it shifted down. We played with parallel lines, and we noticed that parallel lines had the exact same slope, and we're like, that's so great. And we used it to help us write equations and cool stuff like that. But today, we're going to push it a step further, and we're going to talk about vertical dilations of functions. So in this activity, in 3.3, we're going to consider how dilations impact the graph of a linear function. Now, when I say dilation, if you've ever had your eyes checked at the optometrist, you might know what I'm talking about. A dilation is when you make something bigger or smaller. Don't actually change its shape. So you either stretch it, I'm going to change it a bit. So you're either stretching something or you're compressing something. So you're making it bigger by stretching it out or you're compressing it by squishing it down. So that's what we're going to be doing today. So here's the deal. Um, we've got inputs, we've got outputs. Hey, you know how this works. X is our input, F of X is our output. That's generally how this happens. But suppose, suppose we have our, uh, by the way, we have our basic function again, f of x equals x, seems to be our guy. Um, so our basic function is here, f of x equals x. We have our lovely table for the original graph, but suppose the output values of f of x are changed by a factor of four. What does factor mean you're gonna be doing to these poor, little output values. Um, so go ahead and do what you've got to do with a factor of four applied to these output values to help you fill in this lovely table over here. And then once you've completed the table, go ahead and sketch the graph of your new guy, A of X, over here. So go ahead and hit pause to finish your table and then make your graph. Then hit play when you're ready to check your work. So I'm going to start by uh, doing some output values, right? This is how it works. This is what we do. I'm going to grab my pen. Factor means multiply. Mm -hmm. Yeah, a factor of four means you're multiplying by four. So I'm going to take each of these output values, and I'm going to be like times four, times four, times four, times four, times four. Please notice we are only doing this to the output values. Our inputs are staying the same. So negative two, negative one, zero, one, two. Staying the exact same, not even changing, not even changing. But we are going to multiply each of these by a factor of four. So negative two times four is negative eight. Negative one times four is, of course, negative four. Zero times four is zero. One times four is four, and two times four is eight. So then I was able to take these points and plot them on my graph. I was like, okay, well, negative two, negative eight. Boom, there you are. Negative one, negative four, boom, zero, zero, boom. Oh, that one didn't change. Uh, one, four, boom, there's that guy. And two, eight, boom, there's that guy right there. And I connected the dots. Oh my, that very much changed my function. And of course, we're naming the new guy A of X. So I'll put that up there. Uh, this is pretty different from F of X. And it's interesting because when we added four onto our function, it pushed it up four. So it changed my y-intercept without changing the slope. But look what's happened this time. Look what's happened this time. This time, my y-intercept didn't change, but my slope sure did something. Hmm, that's very interesting. So let's take this to the next level then. For part B, I would like you to identify our new slope and our y-intercept of our new function. So identify the slope and y-intercept of our new function, a of x, and then see if you can write the equation for that function, a of x, in the general form. Go ahead and hit pause to work this out. Hit play when you're ready to check your work.
Okay, so um, I'm going to employ a few techniques here. So to find the slope, there are a few ways you could do it. You could totally just be like rise over run. So if I go from here to here, you could be like, well, I go up one, two, three, four, and I had to go over one. So that means then that my slope would be four over one. Um, that's one way that you could have found your slope is just the whole rise over run trick. Wow, my handwriting's terrible. I want to make that prettier. Sorry, that's so ugly. Um, so if you want, you can use the graph and you can just say, okay, well, my slope is rise over run. And so I had to rise for and go over one to get to my next point. Um, so that's one way that you could have found the slope. Um, by the way, four over one is just four. Another way you could have found your slope is you could have gone old school. You could have used your table and subtracted some points that also would have been okay as well. You could have used the whole, well, my slope is subtract my y's on top, subtract my x's on the bottom. And so I could have been like, I'm going to use these two points. And I would have been like, okay, well, his y value is negative eight minus that negative four for the other guy right next to him. That's a negative four. And then my x values, it looks like my x values are negative two and ooh, negative one. Ooh, that shouldn't be a comma. Hang on. I will fix, much better. Um, so minus a negative one. And then I would have cleaned it up. Double negative becomes a positive. So this becomes negative four. This also double negative becomes a positive. So that's a negative one. And negative four divided by negative one is a positive four. Either way, either method that you use, you find that your slope is four. Either method is fine, whether you use a graph or a table, doesn't matter to me. Um, and of course, you can see that our y-intercept, like we pointed out, the y-intercept didn't change, did it? So my y-intercept is zero. So if I put this into my general form, y equals mx plus b, or as we know it now, f of x equals ax plus b, I now know that ax, a of x should equal 4x, because that's my slope, plus my y-intercept, which is zero, except I don't usually write 4x plus zero. That's kind of weird. So I'm just going to fix that. And I'm just going to say that a of x equals 4x. Yay. All right. So now you've got the idea of this and how this works. Let's do a few more of these. I warn you, they're going to get weirder as we go. So let's suppose for number two that the output values of f of x are changed by a factor of two-thirds to create b of x. Go ahead and like we did before, complete the table of values, sketch the graph. I will tell you, please leave your output values as fractions. Don't turn them into decimals. These don't make for nice decimals. So please leave them as fractions. It'll make things a little bit, oddly enough, it will make things better. So go ahead and fill out your table, complete your graph, and hit pause to do that. Then hit play when you're ready to check your work. So just like before, this means that I'm going to notice x coordinates didn't change. My inputs are not changing at all. Only my y coordinates, only my outputs are changing. So I'm going to multiply each of these by two thirds times two thirds times two thirds times two thirds times two thirds. So this means uh, negative two times two thirds. Well, negative two times two is a negative four. So negative four thirds it is. Negative one times two thirds just gives me a negative two thirds. Zero times two thirds is zero because that's how zero rolls. One times two thirds is just, well, two thirds. And then two times two thirds is two times two is four. So four thirds it is. It might be a little easier to graph it if you remember that this negative four thirds is equal to negative one and one third. That just might make it a little easier to graph it. And same thing down here. Might be a little easier to graph four thirds if you remember that's one and a third. It just is a little easier to graph. And then of course we can plot our points and yes these points are in some weird spaces but nothing we can't handle. So I'm going to go negative two and then I'm going to go down one and a third. Ooh, that's not very far is it? Uh, negative one, negative two thirds isn't even a whole one. It's only like right there. Zero, zero I've got one, two thirds. Again didn't even get all the way to one. And then for two, I have two and four thirds, also known as one and a third. So I'm gonna go up one and then like a third of the way more. And if I connect the dots, 
I get this lovely guy right here. Hmm. It didn't get stretched this time, did it? Looks like it maybe kind of got a little like squished. Things get squished. It happens. Just like with the other problem though, um, by the way, we're going to label this B of X, but just like you did with the last problem, I would like you to identify the slope and the y-intercept of the function b of x, and then write an equation for the function b of x in the general form. Go ahead and hit pause to work this out. Hit play when you're ready to check your work. Just like last time, you can either use the graph or you can use your table to help you. It's up to you. I'm going to use the graph because I think in this case it's a little easier. So I know that this is one of my points. It looks like I have another point up here. Oopsie. Looks like I got another point up there. So it looks like I have to go over how many? So we said rise over run. Sorry. So I'm going to rise. Looks like I have to rise two. Oh my. Looks like I have to rise two and run three. So if my slope is rise over run, it looks like I had to rise two units and I had to run over three units. So it looks like my slope is two thirds. Hmm, 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 funny that. So it looks like my slope is two thirds. You can see my y-intercept, again, that hasn't changed. My y-intercept is still zero. So that's a fun little bit. So I'm gonna put that into my general form. So b of x equals 2 thirds x plus zero. Now, of course, again, I don't usually put a plus zero on the end, so I can just rewrite b of x as 2 thirds x. Not bad. We're gonna do this all one more time. One more time. Mm -mm, mm -mm. So now I have an extra special bonus for you. Suppose the output values of f of x are changed by a factor of negative 4 to create c of x. So once again, complete the table of values and then sketch the graph of c of x. Go ahead and hit pause to do that. Hit play when you're ready to check your work. You ready? So that means all of these guys are going to get multiplied by a negative 4. So times negative 4, times negative 4, sorry for the bad handwriting, times negative 4, times negative 4. None of my inputs are changing. So negative 2 times a negative 4 is a positive 8. Negative 1 times a negative 4 is a positive 4. 0 times negative 4 is 0. He doesn't care. 1 times a negative 4 is negative 4, and 2 times a negative 4 is a negative 8. And so again, if I were to plot these points on my graph, and I was like, all right, so now I have negative two, positive eight. I have negative one, positive four, zero, zero, one, negative four, and two, negative eight. Look what happened to my graph. Oh my goodness. Sorry, my point was really off. My bad. Um, so here's my lovely graph if I connect the points. And of course, we're going to label this C of X. Check it out. Um, it did stretch. It definitely stretched, but it totally flipped as well. My graph flipped. Notice how the original was going up, was increasing, but now my line is decreasing. Hmm. Why do you think that may have happened? So once again, just like you did last time, I would like you to identify the slope and the y-intercept of the function c of x. And again, just like last time, then write the equation for the function c of x in the general form. So again, hit pause to work that out. Hit play when you're ready to check your work. So, all right, I, like to, I seem to like to use zero, zero. So if I'm looking at this point, and if I'm looking, I can count. I can do this, and I'm looking at this point. It looks like now I'm not going up anymore. So again, if I'm finding my slope, if I'm using that whole rise over run, or like I said, you could use the formula as well with the table. It looks like I now had to go down four units and over one. Sorry for the super bad writing. My goodness. So if I'm going down four, that means that's a negative four over one. And of course, negative four divided by one is, well, negative four. So it looks like my slope is now negative four. Hmm. Hmm. Funny. I wonder how that could have happened. 
So my slope is now negative four. And of course my y-intercept is still zero. It didn't shift up or down. We just stretched it and flipped it. That means that C of X equals negative four X plus zero. Again, it's weird to have a plus zero. So I'm just gonna call it C of X equals negative four X. That makes sense. So I'm hoping you're noticing a pattern here when we start multiplying our outputs by some factor, whether it's a whole, whether it's a four or a two thirds or a negative four. There is a pattern here and you're probably already noticing what it is because you're smart like that. So for the basic function f of x equals x, the transform function y equals a times f of x, now we're multiplying, last time we were adding, this shows what we call a vertical dilation of the function. So again, it either stretches it or compresses it. This dilation affects our output values or our y values of the function. Again, totally didn't affect the x values, only the y values. So here's the deal. If the absolute value of your function is greater than one, then your resulting graph vertically stretches by a factor of whatever A is. If the absolute value of your um, A is between zero and one, then the resulting graph vertically compresses by a factor of A units. For A is less than one, so whenever you get a negative A value, which we noticed on that last one, the resulting graph, it still stretches or compresses depending on what the absolute value was, but if it's negative, then it gets reflected across the x-axis. It fully flips over the x-axis. It's like a whole thing. So for example, our first one, um, our A value is four, right? Well, the absolute value four is four. So since that's greater than one, then that means it's going to vertically stretch, right? Um, for the second one we did, we said our A value was two thirds, right? We multiplied by that two thirds. Well, the absolute value of two thirds is two thirds, which is between zero and one. So that tells me that it's going to compress rest my graph, that it's going to squish it. The last one we did, though, was an extra special bonus. It was a negative 4. If you do the absolute value of a negative 4, you get 4, which means it's greater than 1. So that means, okay, it's going to do a vertical stretch thing. It's definitely stretching. Um, but my original A value is less than 1. My original A value is negative. So this tells me it's going to reflect over the x-axis. So whenever you see a negative, there's an extra special bonus. The general rule is, is that your value is greater than one, it's gonna stretch. If it's less than one, it's gonna compress. But if it's negative, not only do you have to pay attention to stretch or compress, if it's negative, you gotta remember the extra special bonus that it's gonna reflect over the x-axis. So watch out for that. Um, let's go a little, let's just play with this just a little bit just to kind of really cement it here. Can you compare the values of f of negative one and c of negative one? Remember that f of x equals x and that our c of x, that was the last one we did, um, c of x was negative four x, you remember that? So I would like you to just evaluate those real quick and then just compare what happened to our two functions. How did, what happened to it when I plugged in a negative one? Go ahead and hit pause to work this out. Hit play when you're ready to check your work. All right, so we said that f of x was x. So if I plug in a negative one, I get a negative one. Very exciting. We said that c of x was negative 4x. So if I plug in a negative 1, negative 4 times a negative 1 gives me a positive 4. So it looks like I went from a negative 1 to a positive 4. So this vertical dilation actually multiplied the value of my, of x, uh, my function at x equals 1, pardon me, at x equals negative 1 by a negative 4. Yeah, pretty much. Um, let's start bringing us all together, shall we? So now we're cool with, okay, if I add something onto my function, it's gonna 
it's going to translate it up or down, right? Push it up or down, vertical translation. But now we also know that if I multiply my function by a number, then it creates a vertical dilation. It either stretches it or compresses it. So let's see what happens when we start combining these bad boys, shall we? Oh yes, we shall. So I have a whole bunch of these, A through F, all the way A through F. You have these in your book as well. In fact, I think there's so many of them that I actually spilled onto the other page. I don't think they're all on one page. I think it's on two pages worth here. And here's what I want you to do. I want you to do two things. First, actually, I want you to do three things. My gosh, I can't count. Does it worry you that your math teacher has trouble counting? Possibly. So I want you to do three things for all of these, A through F. For each one, I want you to describe the transformation. So I've given you a lovely little guy here. I want you to describe the transformation that we're performing on F of X to produce G of X. I then want you to graph G of X. Mm -hmm. Y intercept, slope, you know these things, you know these things. And the last thing I want you to do is I want you to write the function, write g of x in the general form instead of having this weird f in there. Go ahead and hit pause to work all of these out, a through f, and then hit play when you're ready to start checking your work. background noise. All right, let's do this thing. So first of all, I see that it's being multiplied by two. So that tells me that two is greater than one. So that tells me it's going to stretch my function by a factor of two. I also see that plus seven though, which means it's going to push it up seven units. So I've got two things happening here. So the function is vertically stretched by a factor of two because it's being multiplied by two. And it's translated up seven units. Now, hopefully, you are also catching the fact not from our last lesson that this is your y-intercept and this is your slope. So what that means is my y-intercept is going to be all the way up here at 7. My slope is 2, also known as 2 over 1. So I'm going to go up 2 over 1, connect the dots, and boom, I got a graph of g of x. Yeah. So there's g of x. It's beautiful. It's pretty. It's lovely. One last thing, though, we do, and I'm going to erase my markings there because that looks messy. Ew. Um, one last thing that we do want to do as well is, of course, we do want to uh, write the function equation in general form. So I'm going to replace f of x. We know what f of x is. f of x equals x. It's the basic function. So I'm just going to substitute that in here. So that means um, if I do 2 of times x plus 7, that means g of x is just 2x plus 7. Let's do the next one. So for the next one, I now see that I'm getting vertically stretched by a factor of 3. I totally am multiplying by 3. And now I see a minus 7, so that means it's getting pushed down 7 units. So since it's getting pushed down 7 units, that means my y-intercept is now all the way down here at negative 7. My slope is now 3, so 1, 2, yeah, I can count. 1, 2, 3, and over 1, boom. And, of course, if I connect the dots, I get this lovely guy, and there's g of x. Once again, I know that f of x is equal to x, so instead of f of x, I can substitute in an x. And I get 3x minus 7 for g of x. Yay. Next up, we've got g of x equals one-third times f of x plus two. Well, that one-third, that one-third, that's less than one. One-third is less than one, isn't it? So if one-third is less than one, then it's not going to stretch it. It's actually going to compress my function. And, of course, the plus two is going to translate it up two units. So my function is vertically compressed by a factor of one-third, and it's translated up two units. So that means my y-intercept is at two. This means that my slope is now one-third, so I'm going to go up one and over three for my next point and connect the dots. Yay! Hi, g of x. Again, I'm going to substitute in for f of x. Instead of f of x, I'm going to substitute in an x. So one-third times x plus two means that g of x is just one-third x plus two. Hooray. 
For part D, uh, 1 half times f of x minus 3. All right, that 1 half times f of x, 1 half is less than 1. So it's going to compress, it's going to vertically compress my function again, isn't it? Cutting it in half. But I also see that minus 3, so I'm going to translate it down 3 units. So that helps me with the graph. If it's going down 3 units, I'm going to go 1, 2, 3 down to negative 3 over here. I know it's getting squished by a half, so I'm going to go up 1 and over 2. And again, connect the dots, la, 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 la. And there's g of x. Once again, I know that f of x equals x, so I'm just going to substitute in an x for f of x, which means I end up with g of x equals 1 half x minus 3. Great. But now I'm going to mess with you. What about this guy? g of x equals negative 1 times f of x minus 4. Hmm. Well, 1 doesn't stretch or compress. However, a negative does reflect over the x-axis. So that negative, this negative right here, is going to mean that everything up top is going to flip to the bottom, and everything on the bottom is going to flip to the top. Yes, it is. I also know then that that negative 4 is going to translate everything down 4 units. So I know my function is reflected over the x-axis and translated down 4 units. So I'm going to have to go down 4, 1, 2, 3, 4. And of course, my slope means I'm now going down 1 over 1. And if I connect the dots, boom, there's g of x. Once again, I'm also going to substitute in. I know that f of x equals x, so instead of an f of x, I'm going to substitute in an x. Negative 1 times x minus 4. Well, negative 1 times x is just negative x. So g of x equals negative x minus 4. One more. One more. One more. Just one more. Uh, g of x equals negative 2 thirds times f of x plus 5. Okay, that negative. The negative two-thirds, I know that negative is going to reflect over the x-axis. I know that's what's going to happen. Um, two-thirds. Two-thirds is less than one, right? So that means it's also going to vertically compress my function by a factor of two-thirds. Uh, last but not least, I see that plus five. So it's also going to vertically translate my function up five units. Ooh things happen. So it got reflected, compressed, and pushed up five units. Oh my gosh, this is crazy. But it's not that hard to graph. I know that that plus five means my push up five units. So I push up five units. One, two, three, four, five. Um, it is going to get flipped. So instead of going up, it's now going to go down. So sad. That's what negatives do. They flip things. Um, and of course, this means I'm going to go down two units and over three. So one, two, one, two, three, make my next little dot. And then I will connect the dots, la, 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 and I get g of x. Great, great. Oh, last thing, instead of f of x, I know everywhere I see f of x, I can replace it with x. So I'm just going to pop that in there, which means that g of x equals negative two-thirds x plus five. Ooh, that was a lot. That was a lot. It's okay. We've got this. We can do this. It's fine. So when a function is both translated and stretched vertically, the resulting function can be written in the form of a times f of x plus d, where d represents that vertical translation of f of x, pushes up, pushes down, and a represents that vertical dilation of x of f of x. It either stretches it, stretches it vertically, or compresses it vertically. One or the two, right? So considering this lovely function that we just wrote, g of x equals a times f of x plus d, I do have two questions I want you to answer, a and b. We'll start with a. How does changing the a value affect the slope of your function and the y-intercept of your function? How does it affect each of those? Hit pause, write it down, hit play when you're ready to check your work. So changing the a value very much affects your slope. Um, in fact, it becomes your new slope, in case you missed that, because the a value is multiplied by the slope of the function. However, the 
A value does not affect your y-intercept. Did you catch that, that the A value didn't make a single difference on your y-intercept at all? But what about your D value? How does changing the D value affect the slope of the function or the, and the y-intercept of the function? How does it affect those guys? Again, hit pause, jot down your thoughts, hit play when you're ready to check your work. So the D value totally does not affect your slope at all. <laughs> um, it just pushes things up and down. The D value doesn't affect the slope at all, but it does affect your y-intercept. And in fact, in this case, it became the y-intercept of our function, didn't it? Um, because that D value is added to the y-intercept of the function, it does, it does affect it. But yeah, it had no effect on the slope at all. None. None. It's just how it goes. So now that you're getting the feel for this, and I think you are, I have one last little trick for you. Um, the graph shows the linear function f of x, that's the one in black, so f of x equals x, but it also shows four different transformations, k of x, h of x, g of x, f of x. And so we have here as well a lovely table with those transformations, one third times f of x, two times f of x, f of x minus seven, and f of x plus seven. Eight. And what I would like you to do is just to match these up. I would like you to match. Oh, it kind of cut off the directions there. Hang on. Can I help with that? I think I can. I think I can fix it. I can fix that. Maybe. Psh, what maybe? I've got skills. Skills, people. Skills. Look, I fixed it. Now it's pretty. Yay. Um, so I would just like you to match each transformed graph to one of the transformations in the table. So all I want you to do is match up each of these guys with each of these guys. Um, and again, it's just easiest if you write them over here. So go ahead and hit pause, do your matching game, and then hit play when you're ready to check your work. So this first one, one-third times f of x. Well, one-third, first of all, it's being multiplied. So I know it's a dilation, right? If it's one-third times f of x, it's a dilation. So it's not going to shift up or down at all. It's going to have the exact same y-intercept, which is good to know because that narrows it down to either h of x or g of x, doesn't it? Um, this is a one-third that I'm multiplying by. One-third is less than one, which means it's going to compress press it. It's going to squish down my f of x. So that means I'm picking g of x. Yeah, g of x should equal one-third times f of x. Definitely. Next up on my table, I have two times f of x. Um, again, it's being multiplied. So again, I know that it is a dilation, either a stretch or compression. I know that the y-intercept is not changing at all. So my y-intercept should still be zero. That's not going to change which again kind of narrows down my options. I know that if I'm multiplying by two, I'm definitely making things bigger, right? If I multiply by two, I'm making things bigger. That's gonna be a vertical stretch. We're gonna stretch that guy out a bit. Um, so fine, it goes through here and it's gonna be stretched up a bit. I think I need to be picking h of x. Yep, so h of x equals two times f of x. I have over here f of x minus 7. Ooh, okay, if that's a minus 7, that's a d value. That's not an a value. That's a d value. So if it's d, then that means it's a vertical translation of some kind. Well, I know then that that means that my y-intercept is going to change. So my y-intercept is no longer 0, 0. So it's got to be one of these two. Again, it narrows down my options here, doesn't it? That is a minus 7, so that says to me I need to translate down 7 units. And if I'm going down 7 units, well, J of X is my man here. He's my guy. So J of X equals F of X minus 7. The last one is F of X plus 8. Okay, if it's plus 8, that's a D value, not an A value. It's a D value, which means it's a vertical translation of some kind. Um, that means my y-intercept is going to change, so that again narrows down my options. 
Um, it does say f of x plus 8, so that says that I'm going to be shifting up 8 units. I'm going to translate up 8 units. So if I'm translating up 8 units, oh, that means it's k of x. Yep, k of x equals f of x plus 8. Ding! Hooray! All right, guys, as always, I hope you found this helpful and I hope you found this useful. If you've got questions or concerns, please feel free to email me or come see me during office hours and I'll see you soon. Bye.